happening in this community. And I know that as we name it, we claim it. So let's go for freedom today. Take a deep breath. I speak my word for myself, my center, and all its members and friends. I know love as the only reality. I am created out of love. Love is what I am. I know this love as absolute freedom in every area of my life, the life of my center and all who call it home. I know our center's mortgages are paid in full, and I claim for all of us financial freedom with all debts paid and cleared. I release any sense of struggle or wrongdoing. I live in an abundant universe where there is more than enough for all. We experience freedom in every moment by always having more than enough money, vibrant health, and loving relationships. We are who we have come here to be. With hearts open wide, we see the world through the eyes of love. We are blessed. We are rich. And we are free, and so it is. And we use our points of power. I always pay attention. I always tell the truth and tell it quickly. I always ask for what I want when I want it. I always take total responsibility for my experience. I always keep my agreements, and so it is. Thank you, John. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Do you ever wonder, someone in this room does. I don't know which one of you it is. Wonder why we keep singing the same songs every Sunday? Why we keep saying the same prayers? Why you know why we do that? Because we really want to get them in us. We really want those thoughts that we're reading on the screen or that we've memorized and that we're saying out loud to be what guides our lives. And the best way I know to do it is repetition. And you know what? Those things are working. One way that I know is that we have paid down the principles of our mortgage $60,000 so far this year. How about that? It works, but you've got to work it. So Barbara and I say those, those uh, uh, the treatment for freedom and the power, points of power every morning in our spiritual work. And it has made such a, a, an influence, put such a, an influence on how we see the day. So I invite you to do that too. They're at, actually out on the, the uh, Welcome Center if you need a copy of them. So, <clears throat> I'm feeling very Olympic today. <laughs> Who's been watching the Olympics? Oh yeah, good, good, good. Uh, so you'll know a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about today. But I came up with the title for today's talk, really not, not out of the Olympics, but out of this thing that we do around here called a firework. That crazy, crazy thing that we do. I'm really thinking. Y'all recognize that uh, that form? Yep. If you've walked on on the fire here over the years, at any point, I invite you to take one of these, take it home, put it up somewhere. It says, "I walked on fire. I know I can do anything," and that idea is true. Boy, I, when you when you actually stand in front of 12 feet of burning embers that flame up all around you, that glow at you, that is hot, really, really hot. And still, you walk across to mine or someone else's embrace. It kind of sticks with you. The idea that you did something incredible. And it's a great time to, to implant that idea that you can do anything. And it really does work. If any of you were here at the recent firewalk, you may have your picture uh, up on, on our uh, uh, photo board this morning, our, our newly up on the board because Thomas put some up this morning, I understand. If you see something that has you in it and you would like a copy, see Thomas Young and he will be glad to make sure that you get a copy. Right, Thomas? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you for doing that. It's always an amazing feat and that ending point, and it's amazing how most people float into the room afterwards. Probably because they learned how to float over the fire. But we all come back in the room, the stories are always incredible. They're always so moving and the things that people actually achieve by doing that. And you get this sense you really could do anything. Now, does that sense stay with you always? I don't know. 
uh, I keep reinforcing it in me because I keep pushing myself against the envelope to see what else I can do. Like painting a mural. I've never painted a mural before. So we tried that one. <laughs> But the thing is, is that you really can't do anything you set your mind to. We don't really live that way, though. We, you know, we kind of settle. We kind of think, oh, this is what I can do. But you can do anything. What does it take for us to remember that? Well, the Olympics are a great time to do it. So what I bring you today are some stories from, from the Olympics that may just remind you what certain individuals can do. Now, I'm not asking you to do what they did. I'm just pointing out that they started out being little babies and grew up just like you did. They started out uh, you know, with the same challenges of life that you did. And they found something that fed them. They found something that they could excel at and they pursued it. And they pursued it in an amazing way. It really, to me, goes beyond them as individuals. And the perfect example is our first <laughs> Simone Biles is now being referred to as the greatest gymnast of all time. And if you haven't met her, let me tell you a little bit about her. She's 19 years old. She's won 10 World Championship gold medals, two Pacific Rim Championship golds, and the all-round gold for 2015's America's Cup. She is the first woman ever to win three consecutive all-around world championship titles. She didn't have an easy start. She didn't have a secure family when she was very little. She, lived, she was in foster care for a while, and she ended up being adopted by her grandparents, who are really her parents now, and that is her mother that she stands with in that picture to the right. Even with that, she was not deterred. Uh, they, I saw her home movies uh, on, a, on a thing that I watched online where she's like this eight-year-old doing flips in the living room. <laughs> look at me, look at me. And then she gained the discipline to actually become a world-class gymnast now called the greatest gymnast of all times. And it doesn't stop there because from her humble beginnings, she's done some interesting things with her skill set. She's already attracted endorsements before the Olympics from companies like Hershey's, Kellogg's, United Airlines, and Nike. She's already secured about an annual income of about $2 million for her, for her endorsements. Not bad for a little kid that didn't have, have a, a home early on in her life, huh? What an amazing feat. Somehow, this year's uh, big name at the Olympics is Simone. This is Simone May. <laughs> Now there's another uh, uh, Olympian who is just breaking all the records. What's her name, Katie? Ledecky, Katie Ledecky. I'll just tell you, I don't have a picture of Katie up here. She's so good. I would watch her, if you were watching her swim, and they would put that line on the screen of the world record, and she's swimming so far in front of it, and it's her world record. And when she finished that long, long race, she finished nine seconds before anybody else. She finished and touched the wall, and you couldn't see another swimmer in the pool with her hand in the screen. It was fascinating. That was Katie Ledecky. This, though, is Simone Manuel. She won a gold. One won. This may be her only Olympics, but she went and she won the women's 100 freestyle, which is the fast race. She won it by six one-hundredths of a second. But by doing that, for all those years of practice and work, this is, this is, I have trouble getting through this. Her win is so significant because swimming pools have been a racially sensitive flashpoint in the U.S. for generations. During segregation, African Americans were often denied access to public swimming pools. And even after those laws were enacted to prevent such things, still people found ways to keep them out. Here's the, here's the, the statistic that goes with that. Parents who do not swim are often unlikely to teach their children to swim. And the legacy today is that a disproportionate number of African-American children cannot swim. When I grew up, I was told 
that black people couldn't swim. That was a total lie. Come on. That was a total, that was made up to keep people out of pools. I think we're growing past that. I think this woman it will influence thousands of young girls and boys, black and every other color, to become swimmers. She's doing that simply by her, what she accomplished there. <laughs> Following her win, Simone said this, this is for the black kids who got kicked out of the pools. And for all the pools drained because black kids touch the water. We don't ever have to have that again. She's our Olympic champion. Yay. Thank you, beautiful one. Now, everybody knows this guy. He's ridiculously good. <laughs> 28 medals. 23 of them gold medals. No, the next highest number of gold medals won in Olympics is 14 less than that. Whoa. Will anyone ever beat that record? I have no idea. He's been in five Olympics. He transcends time. Whoa. His path hasn't always been easy, though, either. He suffered from depression. He made it in the news because he used marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> He's supposed to be a role model, please. The guy's trying to put his life together, right? Swimming is what he was really good at, so he came and he did that. There's some good things to know about him. He's in a loving relationship. He has a son now. Wow. Boomer. <laughs> Boomer fellas. And his life is working. He started a foundation after the uh, 2008 Olympics in Beijing to help swimmers find their way into the sport <coughs> and, and, and to eat more easily and to really enforce that. He's got a great life going now. But here's an interesting perspective that I uh, extrapolated from his numbers. He's won 23 gold medals. He won three silver medals, which means three other swimmers beat him. <laughs> he won two bronze medals, which mean on two occasions, two other swimmers beat him. Don't you think those guys have some really good stories right now? <laughs> Everybody gets a shot at being the best, and whatever it is. And Phelps is teaching us how to do that, and how to be happy. And you know who these people are? These are the people that participated in the Olympics that have no country. That what? They have no country, they're refugees. They're refugees. They're holding up the Olympic flag because that's the only flag they've got. There's 10 of them. It's the first time ever in Olympic history that people have participated and competed under the Olympic flag. It was important. They escaped devastating civil wars, poverty, and misery. And because they have never given up, they're Olympians. They're Olympians. Not a one of them won a medal. Doesn't matter. They were there. And they get to say for the rest of their lives that they were Olympians. Two, five of them are from South Sudan. Two of them are from the Republic of the Congo. Two from Syria and one from Ethiopia. None of which as countries participate in the Olympics, mostly because of all the tribulation going on in those parts of the world. But they showed up. And there's one story. In the midst of this, it must be told. Here's from Mardini. This beautiful 18-year-old uh, came from Syria. She left Syria to, uh, uh, to find her way with her sister to Lebanon. And from Lebanon, she found her way to Turkey. And in Turkey, she paid smugglers to get her to the island of Lesbos, which is a Greek island, part of the, the country Greece. And that would be the place where she could begin to find her way to the Olympics, because that's what her dream was, was to be in the Olympics. So the smugglers put her, her sister, and 20 other people in a plastic boat with a motor. They started the motor and pushed them out to sea. Go that way. 
30 minutes later, the engine stopped. And they were all stuck in the middle of the ocean with waves bashing their boat, threatening to turn it over. So what this one did is got out of the boat and began swimming, pushing the boat forward, pushing the boat with 21 people in it forward. And through all that it took, she managed to get them as the power for that boat to Greece. She could die. Yes. She saved everybody in that boat. And from there, she made her way to Germany, where she uh, got permission to use an Olympic-sized swimming pool to train. And she was provided with a coach and made her way all the way to Rio to participate. Is that a story? Yes. That's the essence of the Olympics, is that someone will give their all simply to get there, just to get there to compete. I am so incredibly impressed with this woman and what she's done, and all of them for finding their way from very hard times into something extraordinary. You recognize this guy? You're gonna. <laughs> His name is Michael Edwards. He was not in the Summer Olympics. He participated in the 1988 Winter Olympics. He was known as Eddie the Eagle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> kind of a funny guy. Big, thick glasses. But he, from the time he was a little boy, all he wanted was to be in the Olympics. Drove his parents crazy would start to leave home to go find the Olympics. We're talking about like a four-year-old. His mother gave him a box, said, put your medals in this. And then his dad would go fetch him and bring him home. He wouldn't let it go, even as he grew. He wanted to be in the Olympics. He tried out all kinds of, he didn't know what he was going to do in the Olympics. He just knew he was going to be in the Olympics. So he tried out all kinds of things. What finally worked for him was skiing. He actually was a pretty good speed skeeter, skier. He actually could, uh, could move pretty quickly. And in England, he was, oh, no, actually in the world, he got to the place where he was the ninth fastest skier in the world. But the British team didn't want him. They didn't want him because he wasn't properly trained. He didn't have, he didn't, he didn't act and look like all the other skiers that they wanted. So they kicked him off the team. And somehow, he figured out that he should really give this ski jumping a try. Now, if you know anything about ski jumping, you remember when, when ABC used to do uh, Wide World of Sports yeah, yes. and the agony of defeat was a ski jumper that had missed his step and was tumbling. The agony of defeat, great. I researched the guy in that. He, he, he had a rough career after that. He recovered from ABC taking him and putting him on every week on television. But that's not what happened to Eddie. Eddie was this incredibly determined athlete. And even though... He didn't know a thing about ski jumping. He went off to learn. <coughs> and he did. And he got some support. He had no money. His parents weren't supporting him. No one was supporting him. He actually went to uh, 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 Lake Placid, New York, and did his training there. Two volunteer coaches supported him. He had no money for where to sleep, so he, off, he, he, he found people that would let him sleep in their place. At one time when he was, was on a tour in, uh, uh, in Europe, he, he stayed for a while in a mental institution, not, not as a, as a uh, uh, part of the institution, he just needed a place to stay and they'd let him stay there. But he was determined, determined to, to find his way into the Olympics. And he did as a ski jumper. Now, when he went there, he, uh, he had gotten up to the 70 meter jump, which is monstrous. And he did the, did the jump and did it well, although he came in absolutely last. And then he had to do the, the, the 90. He could, didn't have to, but he, he insisted he wanted to do it. And with very, very little training at that level at all, and trust me, you, you are flying. You are flying when you do that, not that monster 90 foot jump. He did it and he landed. He had the worst distance of any Olympian that year. And a lot of people scoffed at him. The media called him Mr. Magoo because he had thick glasses. One Italian journalist called him, what was that? Called him a ski dropper <coughs> instead of a ski jumper. But many people admired his courage because that is a really dangerous sport. And he was able to actually achieve that. 
and he became kind of a cult hero after that and went on talk shows all over the world, was on The Tonight Show. Uh, he really did this purely with heart and very little, tra you know, whatever training he could get, but he didn't have the world-class training that most athletes get. They only, he jumped 71 feet on that 90, um, 71 meters on that 90 meter uh, slope. But he completed it, he did the work, and he is an Olympian, amazing. At the, uh, at the end of the, the Olympics, the uh, uh, or Olympic Organizing Committee Chair, President Frank King, spoke from the podium to all of the athletes and said, you have broken world records. You have established personal bests. Some of you have even flown like eagles. And that was a direct reflection of what Eddie had done. There's a, there's a movie out right now called Eddie the Eagle. I really encourage you to see it. So why am I sharing these stories with you? I don't think any of us in this room are gonna be Olympians, but all of us are called to do something extraordinary in our lives, something that no one else can do. Rumi called it the purpose. He said, that's why we're here and there's no other reason. We're here to achieve something in our lives. And I just don't think it's about being rich or being uh, comfortable. I don't think that's our reason for being here. We're being called to contribute somehow to the greater good of life on planet Earth. Probably not in ways that get you headlines in the news, but all of us have a, a reason for being here that only we can fulfill. These guys found theirs and they did great things doesn't matter whether you win a medal. It's are you living your purpose by being here on planet Earth? Are you willing to stretch yourself a little bit further to do that thing that is yours to do? All of us know what it is, whether we're willing to admit it or not. There's something in our lives that calls us and beckons us. And it may sound like an ego thing, but I don't believe it is. I believe this progression of the human experience is up to us. We have to do it. We have to be willing to stretch. We have to be willing to get up in the morning and do what is ours to do, whether it's go to a practice or whether it's to be clear about how we are contributing that day. Something calls us. And I know for all of us that we can find it. I know many people in this room that already have. I have found a good way to do that and continue to do it and to be called by it. To help people, other people, get what they need or what they're here to do. Whatever it is, however it reads in your experience, don't underestimate it. This coming week, I'm going to Los Angeles. Uh, one of my dear friends and a great teacher and leader in this movement, a Nirvana, Reginald Morgan Gale. <laughs> Believe me, his life was just as opulent as his name. Made his transition last week. So we're gonna go back and remember Nirvana in a big way and love on him and his family. And I can tell you he's one who made a difference in a lot of lives. Made a difference in Ron's life. Made a difference in my life. I know he made a difference in Barbara's life. Probably many other people in, in this room, but certainly around the world, thousands of people with his big heart and his big way of being in the world. And as I reflect on his life here, I believe he did exactly what we're talking about. He lived his life to the fullest. He brought himself completely present to the idea that he was here to support others and achieving their dreams. That's for all of us to do. No one's different than that. Everyone has something to contribute. So I call you today. I'm calling you out. Create that life. Do what is yours to do that only you can do. And your life will be so rich. And your life will be all about being wealth, being abundance, and being joy. That's the truth. God bless you. I love you very much.